the time, the apartheid situation was um was very high, you know. Mm -hmm. Um artists were being wooed to come down to perform in South Africa, but in the white era for white people and segregated crowd, and artists were refusing money right, left, and center. Mm -hmm. So working with Jimmy Cliff, uh, we had an offer to come down to perform in Soweto, mm -hmm. right, in Durban and in Cape Town. So we figure those were the right areas for us. So we um we decided to take up the challenge, you know. It wasn't an easy thing getting the visas to go there because at that time you didn't have much um South African um embassies around the world. So in Jamaica, I had to fly to Washington, DC with the passports to get the visas so we can head off to South Africa. So we um we did it. We arrived in Johannesburg. A great welcome. You know, everything was great, just fine. And then um press meeting and all stuff. The most interesting thing, well, Jimmy Cliff decided to go and pay a visit to um Soweto later in the evening, just quietly, you know, just to see what it's like and thing. And he came back and he was astonished to see the kind of situation how people were living over there. Mm -hmm. So the day of the show, that was the most historic day for me because I've never seen this thing yet. Um, The bus came to pick us up. The guy who was driving us was about a 35-year-old guy. He has never been to Soweto in his life, and he was a white driver. So on the way to the stadium, he got lost. He couldn't find his way. So we saw some little youths playing soccer on the side of the road, and then we decided to ask them. And they started to tell us, I said, come on the bus. you know. So they came on the bus through the front door, stood there with us, and directed us to the stadium. When we got to the stadium, oh, my God, I saw hundreds and thousands of people outside trying to get over the stadium wall. And they, they were climbing over barbed wires and all that stuff. So when the bus pulled up now, and all I could hear is, gee, me, gee, me, gee, me, gee, me. And people drop onto the bus, and we had to take time to go through the tunnel and into the stadium. When we got into the stadium, it was packed. And we got to about, I would say, about um, 40 feet from the, um, from the stage, or 40 yards from the stage, because we couldn't go no further. And we stopped there. Now, I got out of the bus to go and speak to the promoter to get some security to lead us to the dressing room. But when I came out of the bus, I saw a lot of security, you know, cops and, um, and police and, and, and army people. And they were looking at me as if I, I, something was wrong with me. I didn't know that it was illegal to wear camouflage, army camouflage clothes in Africa. Mm. So this was the outfit that everybody was dressed in, you know, the musician, the, 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 the technicians, everybody, including myself. So when he got the, um, the, the security to lead us from the bus, I told everybody, come stand in the line and we're going to walk straight. And when we got off the bus, oh, my God, the security, were, were they were shocked. They were looking at us. They were talking in a language. I think it was Kotsar, you know. They were yeah. talking to one another. And I could see the body language. I said, something is wrong. And then the promoter said to me, oh, they are shocked and surprised to see you guys in the army clothes, you know, camouflage army clothes. But it's illegal here. We didn't know. So when we got backstage now, right, I mean, everybody was nervous. The soldiers were running up and down. Then suddenly now, soldiers all went up on stage and surrounded the stage, yeah, right, with their guns in their hands. And then the people now started throwing bottles, anything. They even take off their shoes mm. and start throwing in at the security to get them off the stage. They didn't want to be up the stage. So I turned to the head of security and I said to him, listen, we have to get them down, we have to get them down. You know, he said, no, 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 Our orders from headquarters, they have to stay up there. And they, they, it was getting out of hand. You know, people, I've never seen Coca-Cola bottle big, like about two feet, big Coca-Cola bottle. People were flinging everything. They take off the belt, the shoes, anything with weight. So mm -hmm. a, a, a black MC, a guy who works at a radio station, and a black guy, he went up on the stage and he said, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, Please stop throwing the bottles. You know, if you don't stop throwing the bottles, we're going to call the police. And when he said that, oh, my God, somebody sized him up with a bottle, came flying through the hair and hit him straight across his face. He went to the ground and he was covered with blood. And I was nervous as hell. And I run to the head of security and I said, listen, you have to get them down. You have to get them down. And he said, no, 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 no. They start talking in the language again, right on the radio. 
And then after a while, I see they signal to the soldiers to come off the stage. And when they came off the stage, now the stage was covered with broken bottles, all kind of missiles, you know. So I went up on the stage and I remember um, the sign at the time, the frontline sign was the fist in the hand, mm -hmm. you know. So I held up my hand like this and the, and the crowd got, got quiet. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, we came all the way from Kingston, Jamaica to uplift you through the power of reggae music. Please stop throwing the bottles. We're going to clean the stage and get the show going. And they said, Ray, you know, and they cleaned the stage. And then Jimmy, Jimmy hit the stage with a song, um, Mama, look at the mountain, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you can get it if you really want it. And the crowd was erupt. They were just going wild. People were jumping out. It's the first time in the history at that time you see black and white together. If I if I remember, I should have sent you that video, a copy of that video, so you can see it. See mm -hmm. black and whites all in hands together, you know, dancing in the stadium, jumping around. Even this, the security forces were shocked, but they have never seen this before to see the, the, the black and whites together in one harmony. So they were kind of worried, you know, of the unity. And Jimmy went through, and at that time, Jimmy had a cover version of Bob Marley's song, No Woman No Cry. No cry so yeah. he had the, the cover of it, which sold over a million copies in South Africa, you know. Mm -hmm. So when he touched that song and he was singing that song, oh, my God, the place just erupted. And then I remember standing on the side of the stage and there were some people trying to get into the stadium. They were jumping over the wall and the, the police, they let go the dogs on them. Dogs were biting them and they were punching the dog with one hand, climbing the barbed wire with the other to get over the, the wall. And then I'm standing at the stage, and then suddenly I just see a rope come down in the middle of the stage. And by mm. the time I look up, it was some people sliding down on this rope coming down in the middle of the stage. So the security mm. run to, to grab them, to punch them, and I just run up, you know, and said, no, quiet, you know, just leave them. And they knelt down at Jimmy's feet, you know, and they were kissing Jimmy and hugging, and there was this gentleman, he was in tears. He was just crying, 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 you know, when Jimmy was singing, um, you know, no, no woman to cry, you know, because his version had some different words to it. And it was just one of the most emotional part of the show. But it was a great experience for me. And um, I, from then on, the security forces was just watching us. The next day we went on a sightseeing tour and everywhere we go, I see the same set of people like they're reading a paper, you know, on the corner or in the store that we go and all that stuff, you know, and I said, you know, I think we are being watched. And then we went to a park and a lot of people in the area started to gather around us. And then the soldiers came down in a Jeep and they said, we are not allowed to you know gathering of more than 10 or something to that effect. I couldn't remember. So they break up the meeting with people, you know, and so on. So it was a very emotional one for me, but it was a very historic moment. And I was pleased and, and to know that reggae music was the vehicle that was used to bring both black and white together, right, in Soweto, of mm -hmm. all the places. But most of those white folks who were there, they have never been to Soweto in their life. You know, mm -hmm. they live in Johannesburg on the, on the upper side. So mm -hmm. the, the, the concert was able to bring them together in one love and unity, and it was a very historic moment for me. You know, i never forget. All right, all right, Father. Then on the following day or following days, you went straight to Cape Town where you saw Robben Island where uh, Nelson Mandela was kept. And you also got uh, Jonathan Butler there playing his guitar there. Yeah, well, that was a very historic moment for me because um, we went up to, to Table Mountain, you know. Yeah. We went up to Table Mountain and we had a, a panoramic view of the entire city, Cape Town where we were looking down at Robbins Island, you know, and we were saying, my God, that's where Nelson Mandela is. And mm -hmm. here we are. So we were up in the table mountain beating the Congo drums. You know, we took all the drums with us and everybody was beating drums up there like crazy. You know, and it was just historic, a historic mm -hmm. moment for me. And then the next day, um, one of my guitars was out on the road walking around and he came back to the hotel with a, a, a guy he saw on the road playing guitar. And he said to me, this is our bass player, Senya Ains. He said to me, boy, this guy is a fantastic guitarist, man. You know, we must do something to get him out, man. You know, this guy can play. Uh, so he went into the room with one of my guitarists, Chin Earl Chinna Smith, yeah. you know, and they were jamming together, you know. And I said, wow, you know, and would you believe it? That guy today turned out to be Jonathan Butler, who we met in Cape Town. And this guy is one of the 
top guitarists in the world today. As a matter of fact, he came to Jamaica a few years ago to play on the Jazz Fest. And I sat down with him and we reminisced about that occasion. And oh my God, he was elated. He said to me, boy, you have good memory. You remember everything step by step. And that was another historic moment for us down there. You know, but one of the things that scared the hell out of me is when we were ready to leave to go to, to Brazil, Brazil, right? And we were leaving from Cape Town. And when I was going through the security, um, the alarm went off. So the soldiers with their guns in hand said to me, I have to empty my pocket. So I started taking out my pocket. And then I felt in the side pocket of my jeans, I felt two giant spears. Hmm. Now, that time, if you're caught with marijuana in South Africa, you have gone to prison 15 to 20 years. You know, I don't smoke cigarette. So here am I with two spliff. I remember now it was Jimmy and I think it was China was going to do, they were the two herb smokers and, 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 the, and the promoter warned us, don't take no herb from nobody. You know, he will get it for us. And every night he comes to the hotel and go into his underwear and take out a plastic bag, you know, and give to the guys who, you know, do their little thing. So Jimmy gave me the two splits to keep for him because he didn't want to go out on the road with it. And it was in my pocket. I didn't remember anything about it. He didn't remember either, right? Until the day we were leaving. And when I pushed my hand in the pocket and I felt um, that the, the, um, the split was coming up in my hand, I started to think about joining Nelson Mandela in prison for 15, 20 years, you know? So I let it go and I went into the other pocket. And luckily I found the room key so the room key had a, a, the map of South Africa, and we all loved it. So we stole the room key to keep for a souvenir. But the metal on the room key was what um, kicked off the alarm. So when I took the key out and put it in the tray and went through, oh, I was so lucky, no alarm, and we just took off mm -hmm. and we, 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 we left. So that whole trip was very historical for me. It was a great moment in time because six months later, I applied for a visiting visa to go back there to visit some friends. And I was denied it, mm -hmm. you know? And I asked one of the officials, you know, why was I denied it? And one of them whispered to me and said, because it's on record that you were part of that peacemaking group who brought the people together, oh. you know, the black and whites together. So they don't want me to come back there at the time because I, I may be leading a, a, a throng of people to unite the people. And that's how I was denied a visiting visa at a later stage. But years later, I was able to visit when things got different and the changes and Mandela was out and I met Mandela when he came to Jamaica and we talked about that, you know, and he laughed like crazy, you know, and so, oh, so I would have had a Jamaican with me inside there, you know, okay. so it was great, you know, great All right. experience. All right. Uh, can you take us through to the Swaziland tour with Peter Tosh, father? In 1980. Yeah, well, that tour was specially designed. How did it happen? We yes, met we met some um, some people in in Australia that day who came from that region. They were mm -hmm. going to school in there, and they brought the idea to us to come to um to to Swaziland. Now mm -hmm. to go to Swaziland at that time, you'd have to go through Johannesburg, you know, True. which you know going um commercial jet. That was the time, and Peter didn't want to his face to be seen even changing plane, because earlier on that year, right, Peter did an interview with a journalist in New York. And the journalist asked him if he would play in Soweto, in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And Peter said, yes, of course, my people is there. Mm -hmm. But I would not go and play for a segregated crowd. I would play for a crowd where my people can come and experience my music. The journalist put the story out, but he didn't put it that way. He, he put, Peter Tosh agrees to go to South Africa and oh. just leave it like that. Mm. And it created a pandemonium in New York. All journalists, people were media houses. And this was a time when, you know, apartheid was, you know, was strong and thing. And so this was a misrepresentation. So P. Peter said, listen, if we're going to go. He doesn't want to go through South Africa. Not even to change plane because somebody would take his picture and said, here is Peter in South Africa, you know, going for the white folks. So we designed a way where we left Jamaica when we flew to, to London, from London to Germany. And then from Germany to Harare in Zimbabwe, and then the promoters sent um, five planes, four planes for us up in Zimbabwe, you know, and flew us. I think it was a four-hour trip in those small planes down to Mbabe. Here is a, a poster of that historic moment. You know, I don't know if you can see it. Yes, I can see it. Yeah. 
yeah, you know, yeah. When, when he played there, you know, I mean, it, it was it was a great um a great experience for me, you know, because um it was the first time Peter what Peter Tosh now was e exhibiting his M16 shaped guitar. Yeah, man, and I was going to ask yeah, about that. Yeah. Where did he get it? Who presented him? Yeah, it's funny enough, you know, earlier on that year, we were in California. And mm -hmm. then a little youth, about 13 or 14 year old, was in the lobby. And they called me to say that there is a little youth in, in the lobby and he wants to see Peter. He has a gift for Peter. So mm -hmm. they called me to come down. I went down to the lobby and the guy was standing there. And he had this long thing in a bag. I didn't know what the hell it was. And I looked in it. I saw a guitar shaped mm -hmm. like an, an M16 gun. And I said, wow. You know, so I said, let me take him up to Peter's room. So I took him up to Peter's room and Peter looked at it. When Peter looked at it, he was elated, you know, and he turned to me and said, no, I can't shoot them down musically. You know, he, he, he's doing his songs, you know, so when he's playing yeah, it, he will shoot them musically, you know. The youth is a guy, he's still alive now, you know, he lives in California. His name is Bruno Kuhn, okay. you know, and he constructed that guitar. You know, and brought it to Peter. Then said, what he did, you know, Peter called his lead guitarist, Donald Kinsey at the time, to come up to the room and they check it out and it was wild. So when we were at the stadium, you know, we had two days at the M Bambani Stadium, right, yes, in Swaziland, which is now Eswatini. Yeah. Mm. Right, you know. And when there was about thousands of people outside, couldn't get in, you know, they didn't, um, couldn't afford the five rand to get in at the time. And then somebody came and told Peter that thousands of people outside can't afford it. And Peter stopped the show. And he went to the mic and he said, listen, promoters, open the gate and let in my people or else I'm not going any further. And mm -hmm. the people outside heard it. And the gate was, and the walls was about to come down. You know, I ran out to the gate and the promoter said, he, he has no choice to open the gate. And the promoter threatened that he's going to sue me for breach of contract. Because he said for Peter to stop the show and said, letting the people outside free is a breach. And he, he was right, you know, but there's mm -hmm. nothing I could do, you know. And then when the people rushed in, took over the VIP areas and people were there with their fists in their hand going like this, like this. And then Peter took up the M16 shaped guitar and kicked off with the song. We're going to fight, 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 fight against apartheid. Yeah, <laughs> brother's going to fight, fight. Fight, fight against apartheid, and the crowd was just jumping like crazy. I mean, he did that song for about 15 minutes straight mm. because people were just elated. You know, I mean, the security was was, was scared, but they saw everybody together, you know, mm. uniting and enjoying the music. And then the promoter said, uh, came back to me and said, you know, I'm I'm not gonna sue you, but he said he was gonna freeze the the, the, the fee, which was in escrow, but because he wanted some more acts. On the agency that we were assigned to, like the Commodores and some other people, you know, and he knew I had connection with them. He said to me, OK, I'm not going to, you know, share a lawsuit against you, but please tell Peter next time, don't do that again, because people will not buy a ticket. They will wait until somebody announced to open the gate free and come in, you know. So right. that 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 experience for us was very great. And it, funny enough, you know, it was the first and the last time for Peter Toy, it was his first time performing in the motherland, right? Because, you know, he has been to Africa before in Nigeria, right? And that was his last time performing overseas before his, his passing. Because after that show, we came to Jamaica and did one last show. And then he has never performed again. And right up to his passing, you know, his tragic passing, you know. So that trip to Swaziland was very historical. And it was last year. The, the, the ambassador for South Africa um, um, presented the Peter Tosh estate with a, um, a, an award, you know, for that particular show of bringing the people, you know, together. Because mm -hmm. people were tracking, trekking from South Africa. People were walking from over South Africa, coming through the borders. And mm -hmm. the security at the borders didn't know what the hell was creating this big throng of people going through. So sometimes they closed the border for hours and people sit there because a lot of people who had tickets for Friday didn't arrive there till Saturday mm. because of the long trek and wait at the borders. 
So it was another historic moment for reggae music mm -hmm. and for the artists, you know what I mean? And I'm happy that I was at least there for these two historic moments to experience it myself and be a part of it, you know? Yeah. So how did Peter ride that unicycle? Yeah, you know something, he, he, um, he's been riding it. He started practicing it for a long time, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, when he, he mastered that, that unicycle, you know, because even his son, Andrew Tosh can ride it, and his grandson, Ray Tosh, can ride it too, you know. So, you know, I have a picture with the three generations of Tosh on it. And I remember when we were in Nigeria in 1982, and we were downtown Lagos, and Peter took out the unicycle out of the car mm. and started to ride it around the city. My God, roadblock. People were running behind him like the Pied Piper. They've never seen somebody riding a unicycle, much less this the man. And when people heard that, it was Peter Tosh. Oh, Jesus. Traffic jam. People stopped the car in the middle of the road and come, you know, to really look at Peter. And he was balancing in the middle of the road with it and so on. You know, it was just a very, very, very interesting time, you know, with that unicycle, you know. Let's see. Mm -hmm. So uh, what type of person was Banuela as you worked with him? Well, Banuela... Um, but funny enough, you know, Bonavela and myself, we went to school together. Okay, you know, right. me, him, it's and primary Marcia. school, huh? Yeah, yeah, we went to primary school together, um, mm -hmm. kindergarten school. From we were five year old, so I knew I know him very well before he started singing. While mm -hmm. we were in school, you know, he wasn't really a singer in school. He was a dancer. He was a great dancer because I was a dancer too. So we used oh. to compete with, with, you know, for, for to get the, the the prettiest girl in school because we can dance like crazy. Mm -hmm. Master group was the singer, you know. Mm -hmm. So when we um left school and in our teenage, and I surprised living in Trenchtown, I was going home one night and I heard people singing in this yard near First Street, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I, I stopped and I went in, I looked, I saw Neville. He wasn't Bunny Whaler then, he was Neville Livingston. Never right? Right and he was called Bunny Livingston. It wasn't Bunny Whaler yet. Bunny Livingston, Neville Livingston. Bunny is his pet name, you mm -hmm. know. And um, it's funny enough, you know, and I saw Neville singing. I said, what? Neville is singing. He said, yeah, man, this is it. And I saw them singing. And this guy, Georgie, who, who, who was cooking porridge, that's the same person who Bob sing about. And Georgie would light the fire in No Woman No Cry. You yeah. know, they were cooking porridge. Joe Higgs was there teaching them harmony structures and thing. And, you know, they were coming together as a new group. At that time, it was about five of them were singing. You know, you had, um, beside Bonnie, Peter, and Bob, you had Junior Bratwaite, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had Beverly Kelso. Beverly Kelso, You know, yeah. this girl who, who, who yeah, lived in the area, a little teenage girl. Was Cherry Smith know, not, not there could, at the time? Yeah, she Cherry could Smith. sing, and Bob, um, Bob went to her parents and spoke to her, them about to let her join the group. And okay. they said, okay. You know, they trusted Bob, you know, because living in Trenchtown at that time, you know, oh. it was an easy thing, you know. And I'm really happy that I really had that experience, you know, living in Trenchtown, where all the stars came from, you know, where the music really was born out of, you know. And if you listen to that song that Bob Marley did on the Natty Dread album, where he said, Dread Natty Dread, I walk got from first street to second street to yeah, see Natty yeah. Dread, jump a fence to third street, mm -hmm. meet some dread on fourth street, I go around the corner on fifth street because I got to read seventh street, Natty Dread. So it was out of that experience and the song Trench Down Rock, you know, mm -hmm. came from all of those experiences. So Bonnie was the more, the more articulate kind of person. And I, in you notice in my book, I said, you know, um, he, he, he was the more, he was formally educated. He was more formally educated than the rest because okay. he went to, to, to junior high school and senior high school while as Bob and Peter, they weren't um, academically up there, but they were street smart. But Bunny was the educated one of the group. So he always you know, profiled that kind of way because his experience was, 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 I wouldn't say rich, but they weren't poor, you know? Because his, his parents could afford it, to, you know, to send him to, you know, high school and college to get the higher education. When our parents were poor, we couldn't afford to, you know. So when we reach a certain level, like 15, 16, you know, that was it. You know, we couldn't go to colleges and high school and all that kind of stuff. But Bonnie did, you know. So he went to Camperdown High School, you know, which is a very well-known 
um, school in Jamaica where that athlete, you know, the one of the Jamaica top athletes um, came from. So he um he was the more of that type of person. He profiled that kind of way. So, you know, he was a little more difficult to deal with with certain things. And he was really the first one who sight up Rastafari, so to speak, you mm -hmm. know, because um when Johnny Nash came to Jamaica in 1967, you know, you know, Bonnie was in prison at that time, you know, for, for a spliff, you mm. know. He, he stayed, he got, he got 14 months in prison for a spliff. Can you imagine just an ordinary little spliff, you know? Mm. So um, that's why he wrote that song, Battering Down Sentence, you know. Yes. He wrote it when he was in um when he was in prison, you know, and it's yeah. from his experience. So mm. he was um and he was very talented, you know, because he, he had one of the best tenor voices, you know, mm -hmm. that you could see around. And even when Bob had left and went to Delaware to live with his mom for the 10 months, when he took over the lead, the lead vocals and they recorded quite a few songs back then with Bonnie on lead vocal, you know. So he, he played some great roles, you know, with, um, with them, you know, in that early stage where he took over the leadership. When um Bob um when Bob had to migrate to um thing, but one thing I must tell you, you know what you must remember that when when um when the the the, the group went to Paxson to record, they 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 had the name Whalers, but little did they know that there was another group that had the name Whalers, right? Yeah. Who were from the United States, you know, in Tacoma, Washington. Mm. Here's a picture of them. You know, this is the original whaler, some white guys. Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah, some white guys there, you know, who, who, who um, you know, who okay. had the name. So okay. when Cox, when they went to Coxon Studio to record, Coxon didn't use the name the whalers because he was he was traveling a lot then because he's part of the farmer program. So he mm -hmm. decided to call them the whaling whalers yeah. instead of just the whalers. And this is the, the picture of them, right? I don't know why when I put up these things, I don't get to see. I can see. Yeah, the right. whaling whalers. Milas, that yeah. was the name that he gave to them, you mm -hmm. know, when they um when they start recording. And he called them Bob Marley and the Whalers and the Whaling Rude Boy Whalers, you know, and Bob and the Whalers. So the name Bob and Bob Marley and the Whalers originated from way back in the 60s when they were at um, um Studio One. And even when they left to form their own label, Whale and Soul M, they wow. used the name Bob Marley and the Whalers. So this myth that people publishing on internet and on Facebook that it was Chris Backwell who mm. mashed up the group, you know, mm. and call it Bob Marley and the Whalers to put Bob up front. No, no, no. They were using okay. that name from way before they even met Chris Blackwell. As a matter of fact, when they signed their contract with Island Records, in 1972, they mm -hmm. signed under the moniker of Bob Marley and the Whalers. See it right here, my finger, okay. you can see it. Okay. Yeah. You know, each of them name, and it's a PKA, means professionally known as Bob Marley and the Whalers. Okay. Right? So people must stop publishing the wrong information to, to newcomers in the business because when they, yeah, wait, no, this is enough proof to show that, you know, that is a myth. And nothing like that. For so they've been using the name Bob Marley and the Whalers for years before they met Chris Blackwell to sign with Chris Blackwell, you know, to do those two albums, Catch a Fire and Burning. All right. Uh, can you also take us through to your African tour, Father? Who initiated that African tour? Oh, yes. It was um, in 1988. I was given the honor of taking over the Reggae Sunsplash African tour. You know, um, and I, a matter of fact, it was about two weeks before the tour was scheduled to kick off that I was approached by some people who represent um, the, the promoters in um, Liberia. You know, um, the guy was second in charge to, to, to President Doe at the time, mm -hmm. right? And they asked me, they said, I'm the only experienced person to take over this tour because the organizers of Sunsplash themselves backed out because they asked, they wanted a million US dollar in their account before they leave, because it was about 130 people. You know, it was groups like Fela Kuti, um, King Sonny Ade, you know, Burning Spear, Sly and Robbie, Yellow Man, um, Jimmy, not Jimmy Clip, um, Chalice, Hugh Roy, Judy Moat, Chalice Band, um, and, and, um, and, um, 
on um, Yellow Man with Sly and Robbie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was the entourage, you know. So I took it over and my, my until I didn't know what I was getting into because um, the first thing before I left Jamaica, the Minister of Health called me to a meeting and said to me that they heard that I'm going to Africa with over 100 people, you mm -hmm. know, and they want to make sure everybody is okay and protected and so on, you know. Um, so I tell them, everything is fine. Our musicians are well behaved, you know. They said, no, no, we know what musicians are like. So I said, what happened? They asked me where I live. They said, you know, I give them the address and everything. Long story short, when I got home the night, I saw my fiance standing at the gate and I was wondering why was she standing at the gate at 10 o'clock in the night? When yeah. I pulled up at the gate in the car, she said, she starts screaming at me. She wants to know what kind of tour are we going on? You know, because a truck, pulled up at the house earlier on in the day and dropped off 10,000 condoms, mm. right? 10,000 condoms, you know, the Ministry mm. of Health giving us a take on this African tour. Though, how do you explain to your, your other half that you're carrying condoms on tour? That means they have some, you know, some <laughs> to your motive, you know? So we couldn't take the 10,000. I took 5,000 and left five, you know, for a friend to, who's coming up later to bring it up. And would you believe it, you know, we started out in Liberia, mm -hmm. right? And we performed in live. It was a 10-hour show, you know? Mm -hmm. We started out in Liberia, and it was great, you know? We didn't realize now that in Africa, the circuit is 240, and all the equipments came from the United States, mm -hmm. you know, from a big company in the United States. That means you're going to you, you're gonna need a, two big KVH generators to run the, the show. And that was where the promoters fell down and didn't have that. So after we left Liberia, we, we went to Democratic Republic of the Congo, which was Zaire, Zaire at the time, you know. And we arrived in Zaire, you know, and my gosh, you know, it was like unbelievable. I, I, I know if you read the story about that part in the book, you got, it's like a movie because I ended up, ended up going to the, 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 the president's palace by mistake. With the entourage, because we're supposed to stay at a hotel named Red House, but it had a little word in bracket named Enceli. And I didn't pay mine to Enceli. So when we got to the airport, we told the driver, take us to Red House. Mm -hmm. And with the drivers, they spoke French at the time, you know. But mm -hmm. we couldn't understand. They kept doing like this. No, 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 no. Ooh, 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 ooh. And we didn't know what the two to mean. Right? Till when we got there, we saw soldiers with guns standing at the gate of this so-called hotel. We mm -hmm. thought we were going to the hotel. And then when I, I couldn't, the guy at the door spoke English French, so I couldn't communicate with him. And somebody came along who understood English. And I told him I'm trying to find his front desk so I could check in the group. The guy said, front desk, tell you to kill him now. So they took me inside a big room where generals were having meetings and everybody looked at me. And one of them said to me, what can I do for you, sir? I said, sir, I'm getting angry. I have over 130 people on the way from the cause. I went ahead, you know, on the way to, to, to I want to find the, 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 the front desk so I can check in the group. The man said, check. What are you talking about? So I took up my itinerary and I showed him. So here is the, and he looked at it and said, oh, Red House and Selly, 50 kilometers north or somewhere. It's, it's another place named Red House. So we were, he said, president live here. So we were trying to check into the president palace and by mistake. <laughs> So we ended up at to go up there. But when we went up there, the hotel, it was an old YMCA building and everybody said they're not staying there. Finally, we ended up at the Intercontinental Hotel. But we spent a whole week in Zaire, right? And could not, up till now, we have not done one show in Zaire because they couldn't, they didn't have no generators to mm. run. We went to the stadium where the show was supposed to keep. And the, the generators were running on two parties down there. So we spent a whole week. And then somebody told us that the U.S. Embassy have a lot of generators. And we got there the Sunday. Sunday, we had to go to the ambassador's home. And then um, he asked me a couple of questions about the, who, are, who is on the show. And I told him. It sounded like he was, he was going to help us. And then he said he will get back to us. And then later in the evening, some people came from the, uh, the ambassador's residence and had a meeting with me in my room and told me that they don't have any generators that can help us. But a white woman who was in the room pulled me aside and whispered in my ears and said, we have an artist in our entourage who's very radical about, speak bad about the United States, you know, which is fella. 
you know, because Philip was radical at the time, you know what I mean? I said, so we never get to do it. So we had to move on now to Lagos, right? Mm -hmm. To Nigeria. And we did two and um, three shows in Tafawa, Baliwa Square. And then afterward, we went up to Benin, right, mm -hmm. to do another show. And that's when um, El Pop Loose Day, because the promoter disappeared. He didn't pay a lot of people in the city, right, who, were, who were worked. When the people decided that they're going to hold us hostage until we find a promoter, they're not leaving us. So they're surrounding the hotel. And we couldn't get out of the hotel to go back to Lagos, you know. So I had to come up with a plan, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, to escape through the back gate. So we told the, everybody to one by one carry it to the luggage put on the bus, don't create, because people were way out at the gate. The gate was about 500 yards mm. from the hotel. So people were gathered out there, bad people from the, from the areas, waiting because the promoter disappeared and gone, and they're holding us hostage. And we were able to escape through the back gate three, three four o'clock in the morning and mm. headed down to, um, to, 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 to Lagos. They held on to the equipment, right? When they found out that held the equipment truck, you know, and so they're not letting it go. So we had, we ended up into Lagos and we were there for a couple of days. And then I decided that um, I'm going to send a friend to go up to, to he, who knows some of the bad guys, I mean, Benin. And mm -hmm. this guy named John, he went up there and talked to them. And then he called me and said that they are coming down to, to Lagos to meet with us. So I had to call Fella to come over to help us. And actually, so we sent to our office in New York for $20,000. US dollars to see if that could pay off these people. But it wasn't enough, you know. So we had to call Fella to act like he's the one lending us the money, you know, and everybody respected Fella. So when they saw Fella walk into the meeting, all the truck drivers and everybody bowed down, you know, yes, sir, sir, and thing. And then he said, Oh, these are my friends from Jamaica. Promoter has left us stranded, and you know, they don't have no more money. So you have to take this, you know, and they agreed. And that's how we got out of it and so on. But that was another movie that 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 whole trip there is going to be a documentary movie someday you know mm -hmm. no we can't finish it uh in one day this this history maybe we'll come with a um, part three of it can you just summarize mm -hmm. uh can you just summarize your book now in just uh, okay. three minutes? Well, well, as you know the book is very you know, reggae by light is, you know, yeah. right? So everybody can see it there. Um, it's 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 one of the hottest book in reggae now because um, it has some historic stories in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have seen the online version of yeah, some of the yeah, stories them. True. And I mean, it, people are amazed when they read some of these stories about the artists and mm -hmm. their, um, and their, their, their career and some of the incidents that happens on the road. And, mm. you know, I didn't want to get into no artist's personal life, you mm. know, because mm. I know everybody's personal life. You know, last night I was talking, I show you everybody's birth date mm. and all that stuff, you know, that I have. So I have everybody's personal record. So, mm. But it was, it's basically about my experience in the business, working mm. with all these artists, because I worked with about 98% of mm. all the artists in reggae business, which mm. I, I have to give God thanks for that. Because I'm privileged, because not much people have that opportunity to work with so many artists so close to them, mm -hmm. you know. And um, it's a great honor for me that I was able to do this, you know. So the, the book carries um, great stories, you know, about the artists, their career, you know, mm -hmm. even how some of the groups um, had problems, problems that they experienced during, you know, their sojourn. You know, Black Uhuru, how they were hot and then they broke up. The Whalers, the same thing, the breakup of the Whalers. So it, it gives all these first hand stories. And you at least you can see in some of the pictures them go, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to go to authenticate a lot of the stories them and so on. So what I'm planning to do is next year I'm gonna be doing tour titled Setting the Record Straight. The title of it is Reggae My Life is Setting the Record Straight. And I'm going to have Sly Dunbar and the Revolutionaries band, right? Because that's the band I used to launch the book um, in Rotterdam Festival. And that band consists of legendary musicians like Lloyd Parks, Earl China Smith, Dean mm -hmm. Fraser, you know, Lenky, Bobler, you know, all these historic musicians make up that band 
who was the man that created a lot of the hit music back in the 70s when message music was the talk of the town. So I'll be doing a tour on that to promote the book and promote um, the, 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 the artists that are in the book because I'm going to have artists who have been mentioned in the book, you know, on the tour with me. So, you know, if you want to get the book, it's easy. You just go online and order it on Amazon. And in a few days, I have friends from Australia who have ordered it and everybody's elated about it. Even David Rodigan in England, when he got his copy, his copy he sent me a picture with him and the book and said, this is one of the greatest books. He has ever read he has ever read you know so i think you know everybody should get it and learn a lot about the music and the artists you know these regular artists that they love dennis brown peter tosh everybody is in it all right i'll always keep in touch with you father no make of thanks let me salute you again yes you know it's um it's a pleasure when i i am um honored that i get this opportunity to technology so we can speak and share some of our experiences with people around the world, especially in the motherland, you know, because 90% of the reggae artists, that's their dream to go to the motherland, mm -hmm. you know, to share their experiences, you know. And since I've been there so often, you know, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to come back there all the time, you know, and to 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 showcase the artists and and and, and the experiences of, of them and things. So I must give you credence and thanks for giving me the opportunity to come on and share these great historic moments in reggae that's what i call them and we don't even reach quarter of, of some of them yet you know but you know i must thank you for for giving me the opportunity to mm -hmm. share and experience it and people keep listening to this station this is a community radio Bukani, right um yeah. please listen to it because you're going to get a lot of historic things about the music, the artists, the people, and the journey. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Tenestilen, Agua, hasta la vista. amigo. All right. Masimba Begolo Shoboke Apo Copeland Forbes Mpula Pulwe VCRF M O Nguye Manager Kapita Tosh We Wailers Bob Marley O Krikara Isaac So Dennis Brown Kwa Kunye Nabanya Give thanks, Father. Thank you. All right. All right. Rain Africa City, give me roots.